change lives, change lives, change organizations, change organizations, change organizations, change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jonah and Galan. That's uh, very kind of you. It's wonderful to be here at this extraordinary institution of, of Stanford. It's probably the only place where I get questions on a live Twitter feed, which if I knew what that was would be a help. But anyway, <laughs> that's just a generational thing. Uh, actually, I always say to people about, about technology, because the thing is, I, I, when I was UK Prime Minister, um, I really didn't have any access to technology at all. Uh, in fact, I didn't even have a mobile phone, okay, which in the light of recent events in the UK is probably just as well. But uh, <laughs> So I, I literally, but, but I, I got my first piece of technology about which I was inordinately excited. The day after I left office, I got in my hand my first uh, piece of technology, which was a mobile phone, right? And I thought I'd immediately send a a text, an SMS, so I sent one to one of my old friends saying, hi, how are you? And because I'm technologically ignorant, I didn't realize my name didn't automatically come up on the text, so I got a message back saying, uh, sorry, but who are you? <laughs> and I remember sitting there thinking, it's been 24 hours. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, I am delighted to be here. I'd like to say a big word of thanks to Stanford, to Garth, um, to Seed, uh, Bob and Dottie King, and everyone who, who supports what is a, a, an amazing and innovative program. And set out for you, I mean, I was talking earlier today up in Seattle about uh, the European Union, so it's an absolute thrill to be able to turn my attention to something optimistic. Um, <laughs> namely, <laughs> namely, that's off the record, by the way, namely the future of Africa. Africa for me is a... Um, an endless source of fascination, inspiration, and challenge. I'm fascinated by the possibilities, inspired by the spirit, and challenged by the immensity of the problems that ache for solutions. Ten years ago, when I addressed the World Sustainable Development Summit in Johannesburg, I was more daunted by this challenge. I focused on my commitment to bringing aid to Africa, leading to the doubling of the aid agreed at the 2005 G8 Glen Eagle Summit and the cancellation of debt. Ten years on, though, my message is a lot more optimistic. As Garth was saying to you, the pace of change in Africa today is dizzying. Its population is going to double uh, by the mid-21st century. 70% of Africans are under the age of 30. In the last decade, six of the world's fastest growing economies were African. And foreign direct investment has grown sixfold over that time. Consumer spending over the next decade is set almost to double, and the middle class also to double, around about from 60 to 100 million people. The number of democracies also in sub-Saharan Africa has risen over the past 20 or 25 years from around 3 to 23. Deaths from malaria, HIV, AIDS, and measles have reduced dramatically literally hundreds of thousands of lives being saved. Much of this is a result of the aid which it's so crucial to maintain. The challenge, of course, is huge. Only one in four Africans have access to electricity. In countries like Malawi, the figure is more like one in 10. It is a continent rich in agricultural resources, but is a net food importer. And still, almost one million human beings die every year from preventable diseases, mainly women and young children. But today, the optimism we describe is not based on hope but experience. Today, my focus is not only on what we can give, but how we can partner. Today, for me, governance, the capacity of African nations to make effective changes in the lives of their people, alongside that aid commitment, is the new approach to Africa. This is, in my judgment, what US and European policy should have at its center. And this approach is what I would call a kind of muscular, soft power diplomacy. It's using our technical expertise, our intellectual capital, our experience of what works in government 
and using it in partnership with African leaders so that African nations can accelerate their development, replace aid with investment, and be masters of their own destiny. And the purpose of the partnership is to empower that new generation of politicians, business people, civic society organizers to create sustainable political, economic, and social growth. Sustainable because we're doing it in partnership with them, not them waiting for us to do it for them or even to them. One thing I notice from all the different parts of the world I see today, from the Middle East to the Far East, from South America to Sub-Saharan Africa, is the real distinguishing feature of successful emerging nations today is the quality of their governance. Now, for years, frankly, uh, governance was the, the poor relation of foreign policy. A few transparency initiatives here, training days for civil servants there. It was basically the kind of uh, eyes glaze over part of overseas aid. In fact, because of the way today technology and capital are so easily exportable and importable, governance is actually the cornerstone of development today. And by governance, I don't simply mean honest government. Of course, corruption is a massive issue. And transparent and accountable government, an essential precondition for a viable future. But it isn't enough. Good government isn't just honest. It also has to be effective. It has to know how to get things done. Vision papers, most of them with um, grand titles like sort of 2020 vision, 2030 vision, these are abundant in Africa. The hard part, though, is not the what, it's the how. It's about deciding priorities, creating a plan of implementation, and then actually doing the damn thing, analyzing, adjusting, and adapting as you go. It's the same outside of Africa, by the way, but it is in Africa where we, from our perspective here, could make the biggest difference. And I want to give you five illustrations of this and then make a suggestion. First, the initial step is often providing capacity around the key decision maker, namely the president. And this is something we focus on at AGI. And, you know, it's a very, when you come into government, um, you know, when I first came into to government in 1997, right, my party had been in power for, uh, out of power for 18 years, okay? So we were a long time out of power. And I always remember my very first day in Downing Street. I went into to Downing Street for the, for the first time on May the 2nd. Um, and it used to be a tradition in, in, it's in British politics when the, prime, the new prime minister comes in, the old one goes out the door with his suitcases, right, and out the back door. And then in the front door comes the new prime minister. Right? So he comes in, and the, the tradition is that you've got the door there in a corridor, and at the end of the corridor, you've got the cabinet room. And alongside the corridor, the civil servants are supposed to line up and applaud in the new prime minister, right? So they say goodbye to the old one, they applaud the new one. Well, the other lot had been in power for 18 years. So they were kind of used to the other lot of people. So when I went in, there were people sort of weeping and as, I, <laughs> as I went down the line. So, you know, by the end, time I got to the end of the line, I kind of felt guilty about the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> but I always remember going in then to the cabinet room at the end of this corridor, and the, 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 the chief panjandrum of the British system was, the civil servant was sitting in there. And I just sort of sat opposite him. I'd never been in government before. Uh, and he just said to me in that very sort of clipped British way, well done, what now? Uh, <laughs> and so I kind of sympathize with anyone who comes into power in these positions. And sometimes what the presidents need in those circumstances or prime ministers, it's very basic things like the organization of an efficient front office, scheduling, proper planning, analyzing how time is used, which people are seen, how the business of government is organized, communications, media strategy. And especially when countries have emerged from prolonged periods of insecurity and conflict, the basic apparatus of government is missing. And we have the means to help supply it. This is especially true in the process of prior prioritization. It's the biggest and toughest thing for any government to do. Show me a leader with 100 priorities and I'll show you someone who's gonna get nothing done. 
choose three or four and make them doable and something might happen. So, give you a concrete example. AGI supported the government of Sierra Leone in implementing their free healthcare initiative for pregnant women and children under five. They've been trying to do this for years. They had the money, but not the capacity. They then did it. Three times as many under fives are now treated as a result. There has been an 80% reduction in deaths amongst such children treated for malaria. Year on year from now on, 1 million children and 250,000 pregnant women will benefit from that policy. They just needed the capacity to get it done. So building that capacity around the key decision makers, the first thing. The second thing is the clearest necessities for most African nations today are usually around infrastructure, energy, electricity, roads, ports, basic infrastructure. Because of technology, notably the internet, power is now the vital prerequisite. If you're getting the lights on and you're getting online, combined with the explosion of mobile telephony, as Garth was saying, it opens up a, a country's potential in a way nothing else can. So in Nigeria, which is the most populous African nation, 160 million people, as the current government rightly recognizes, if they solved the power problem, they would have at least half the answer to the problems of the country. But all over Africa, there is a desperate need for megawatts of electricity that in our systems would be considered almost trivial and in these countries can transform the community. So when the presidents of Sierra Leone and Liberia gave reliable electricity to Freetown and Monrovia, the effect was twofold. People could work, study, and live better, but also they could see politics working. Again, we have expertise and experience in this area, and it matters far more than the small-scale projects that may be very worthy in themselves, but don't actually, don't actually get a nation on its feet. Third, Africa urgently requires quality foreign investment and private sector growth. It's one of the reasons why your seed initiative here is so crucial, I think. It's true the private sector's grown over these past years, but still today, only 20 African companies have revenues of over $3 billion. 60% of the world's uncultivated land is in Africa, and many African countries have enormous quantities of the commodities the world needs, but too often they are exploited without contributing to the country's overall development. But good quality foreign investment doesn't happen by chance. Neither does the encouragement of an indigenous business community. Governance and proper systems of attracting and utilizing that investment are what really counts. But here again, we find the capacity so low. So if countries want to get in business investment from abroad or build their business sector, They've got to have the capability to understand what their opportunities are. They've got to market them, judge the quality of inward investors, negotiate with them, nurture their own industry and create synergies between the intellectual and management capital that comes in from the outside and the native business already there. In all of these areas, help is needed and in related fields. For example, the rule of law, Right. Predictable judicial outcomes for business contracts is of the essence. It's what liberates the possibility of inward investment. Many countries don't have such systems. We can help provide the expertise to make this possible. Fourth, they have an obvious requirement for education and healthcare. Of course they do. What we in the West often do, however, from the outside, is we put money into discrete educational health projects mainly local, usually very visible in bricks and mortar or books and medicine. Now, don't misunderstand me. These are genuinely desirable. They change people's lives. And of course, they play well to constituencies back home who want to see their tax dollar put to good use overseas. However, very often, I'm afraid, they don't transform. Yet these nations, as they develop, and their middle class, which in Africa, means income of over $3,000 per year, as they want better services, they actually need systemic change. 
They need to harness the best lessons on education and healthcare reform from around the world. In fact, they shouldn't replicate or try to replicate our system. Actually, they should leapfrog many of the constraints and limitations which the legacy of our systems have created. Just in the simple, but actually revolutionary use of technology alone, they can advance multiple times faster. We have that technology. We also have the experience and knowledge of what has worked and what hasn't in our countries. We can supply the expertise and the support to these countries to help make that transformation. And finally, countries don't prosper only through strong and effective government or a thriving private sector. They also need social capital. They need civic institutions of pride and purpose. They need community organizations, basic law and order, free and responsible media, and the development of art and culture. Now, in our part of the world, again, we try to do this. Not always well, naturally, but where we fail, we try to learn. We can use this knowledge, and we can help build these institutions of civic society. So this is why I think this issue to do with capacity and governance is so fundamentally important to the future of Africa. It's my agenda for a new approach. It means a new partnership between developing and developed nations, not a dependency. These countries want to take their own future in their own hands, not be dependent on us. It means also a new partnership, however, between our traditional government agencies of development and aid, the new donors in China, India, and Brazil, now making their own development policy, the philanthropic sector, it's an enormously important sector that's done so much in Africa in these past years, and of course the private sector. So the new approach is not just north-south, but within the north and then within the south. Now, no discussion of Africa is adequate today without the mention of China. China's investment in Africa has gone from roughly $6 billion in 2000 to 110 billion today. Okay. China's actually going to put more into infrastructure in Africa this year than the whole of the World Bank commitment. Now some see this as a threat, okay? And I understand the concerns around transparency, but I also actually see it as a spur to us. Many African nations, frankly, welcome the speed of Chinese investment and their get-it-done attitude. But they also want to balance their new friendships. Okay? They're not naive about this. They want some balance there. They need us to be smarter, faster, and more innovative to allow them to do so. Building effective systems of delivery so that more lives are changed for the better more quickly, that is what we can do. So my suggestion is this. There is a new crop of great new development leaders in government, like your own in the US, Raj Shah, but I think two of those in Nordic countries, Europe, Canada, Australia, even my own country, the UK. There's also a new wave of philanthropists, people like Bill Gates, and of course, many here today, like Bob and Dottie. There's also a new sense of corporate responsibility amongst the major investments who use the opportunities of Africa and understand those opportunities, but also know that the best business done today is about caring as well as capital. And then, frankly, since I know roughly half the audience today or more students, there's you. Right? People like Galan and, and, and Jonah and the rest of you. Young people from all over the world, clever enough to get into Stanford, right? but compassionate enough to come here today and listen to a speech about a continent several thousand miles away. So we've got to work together. We've got to put these different sources of energy and commitment and drive and innovation and creativity together. And in doing that, we need to create new streams of capacity, expertise, funding, and delivery 
that become effective agents of change. We have to join what is in our minds to what is in our hearts. Africa is waiting, but it's also moving. And we need to be part of that move, celebrating it, but participating in it. And that's what we can do. That is actually the new approach to a new Africa. So let us go and do it. Thank you. Which one do you want now? Over here. Yeah, thank sure. you. Well, thank you for those remarks, and thank you again for being here. It's wonderful to have you. Uh, listening to you, the, the passion that you bring to the Africa Governance Initiative is, is absolutely palpable. Could you say something at a personal level about what the source of that passion is? Right, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Garth, for having me here, and congratulations on being in the Wall Street Journal this morning. Um, <laughs> So it's good to be with a media star. Uh, <laughs> I um, actually, with, uh, with Africa, my, my father taught in Sierra Leone uh, back in the 1960s. And here's something that's quite interesting. Uh, Sierra Leone back in the early 60s had roughly the same GDP per head as South Korea. But today, <laughs> obviously not. So, you know, the history of many decades in Africa was the history of wasted opportunities, mistakes that we made, mistakes that the countries made. But in this last decade, I feel we've really moved forward. The countries have moved forward, and we've developed our own thinking. And, and really, I, I, I am passionate about Africa today because I go to these countries. I mean, Africa Governance Initiative is in six countries now, probably may take on a seventh. And you know, there's just fantastic people there who, given the opportunities, are going to create great countries in the future. So it's partly, I have to say, very you know, much about the excitement I feel and the possibility there. And, and we need, you know, a lot of the people who come and work in our projects, by the way, um, this is a recruiting uh, pitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> our, you know, some, obviously we have <clears throat> older people with ex experience in, in, in government or the private sector, but we also get people often fresh out of university who want to come and spend a year or a couple of years in one of these places and help change a country, which is a pretty exciting thing to do. Tremendously exciting. So in our immediate neighborhood at, at Stanford University and in Silicon Valley more broadly, there's a lot of emphasis on the formation of new ventures and on entrepreneurship. And, and you spoke in your remarks about the importance of governance for business generally. I'm wondering about the link between governance and entrepreneurship and innovation and and whether that's something that, that AGI thinks about and focuses on. Yes, it's a big part of our focus. But here again, there's just been a paradigm change in the last decade. You see, today in the world, there are vast amounts of footloose capital, right? So there's, you've got sovereign funds, you've got um, Chinese investors and Indian investors and American and European investors looking for new opportunities. And often, partly because of the situation in our own economies, they're looking for returns that they can get elsewhere that they couldn't get in our, in our own situation. But what makes them come into a country? Right? They've got to have predictable rules. They've got to know that they don't have to carry a suitcase of money to get the contract. They've got to know that, that actually if they come in, this, the country itself is trying to build its infrastructure. You know, they, they've got to have places they can go, places they can locate. In time, there'll also be a demand for skilled workers and so on. In other words, if, if emerging market countries, this doesn't just apply to Africa, actually get the private sector framework right, there is no reason why any country cannot get a massive amount of investment in. I mean, and I've seen it happen. You know, so one of the things that my people did in Rwanda is we helped President Kagame there, we, we had a plethora of different bodies doing bits and pieces of private sector investment. So we put it all in one body, which is the Rwanda Development Board. We got, frankly, new people in to run it. We got a group of young people who really, you know, were not about keeping business out, but bringing business in. Um, they didn't have a sort of bureaucratic attitude, but had a very much a pro-business attitude. And, you know, inward investment in Rwanda is increasing radically now. Likewise, we did a big conference for Sierra Leone in London 
you know, we got 1,500 people to that investment conference. Out of it came hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. So the thing that's so important for countries to understand is that actually it's, it's really not hard to know what you should do. Yeah. The difficulty is doing it. So on, on exactly that theme, the, the difference between the what and, and the how, that's something that my colleagues in the business school sometimes call the knowing-doing gap. And you've addressed the, the knowing-doing gap by embedding expertise in the governments uh, that, face, uh, that face the problem with the gap as a way of addressing the gap. So you know, I, I imagine that if I were to gather up 60 or 65 of my MBA students and put them in a classroom and say, Okay, here's your role. You're one of these embedded helpers in, 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 in one of these countries. Let's talk about what some of the challenges might be. We would fill two whiteboards in, in no time. It's, it seems like a, an extremely daunting task to come in from the outside uh, and, and, and help and facilitate. So how, how do you think about that? How do you prepare uh, people? And what do you do to ensure their success? Well, first of all, the, the AGI differs from a traditional consultancy. Not, not simply because it's a not-for-profit and so on, but it, it differs in this way. Our people come and live in the country. They're not fly-in, fly-out consultants. Secondly, they work with an appointed team from the other side. In other words, we're about transferring skill. So when we started in Rwanda, we started with the president and building capacity around the president. We don't work with in directly in the president's office anymore. We're in different departments now. By the way, the young Rwandans in his outfit working around him, I would have been happy to have any of them in Downing Street. So, you know, basically people catch on fast if they've got people working alongside them and you, you, you're getting the right teamwork. And the third thing is I interact politically. Because the problem often with consultants from the outside is, you know, politics is, is, is harder than people think. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really is. I mean... You know, by the way, one of the things I've learned since leaving office is a darn sight easier to give the advice and take the decision. <laughs> but, you know, that's life, I think. But it, it, it's, you know, one of the fascinating things I learned about being a, a leader, you see, this is the journey of politics, if any of you ever undertake it, is you start at your, um, you start at your most popular and least capable and you end at your least popular and most, <laughs> most capable. <laughs> uh, that's the journey of uh, leadership. And what I try to do, there, therefore, is I actually also interact politically with the president. So we try and give them solutions that are also realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, I read some, some of the international institutional r r reports to some of these guys, and I'm sort of reading them thinking, yeah, <laughs> that would be great. But, I mean, <laughs> there's no chance of any of that happening. So uh, practical solutions matter as well. And then, you know, a lot of this is just about smart, disciplined working. And, and process. Now, these countries can be very difficult to work in. Uh, they, they can, you know, you've got a lot of logistical problems, obviously. Um, but just let me single out one thing, which is energy and power today. Because if you can get these countries connected to, to, to the internet, then everything becomes very possible very quickly, by the way. I mean, that is, you know, your thing about the mobile telephones from 10 million to 750 million. I mean, the important thing about that is that's technology. That's, that's, that, that means that liberates a whole swathe of people. Is there a lot of pushback from observers on the outside saying, why, you know, why, why are we reliant on, on, on help from the outside? Uh, I mean, we, we got, we, you, we, we've had some from, uh, actually sometimes less so now, I think now that we've got a track record from the other established donor community who kind of say, you know, who are these guys coming in? And yeah, you do get pushback sometimes from government, but I mean, we only work by voluntary, you know, people need to, to, to want to have us in. But here's one of the things I'm always saying to um, young leaders in, in, in Africa. You know, whether you like every aspect of Singapore or not, one, one of the true, you know, visionary practical leaders of the late 20th century was Lee Kuan Yew. And, and what he created in Singapore is amazing. But one of the things that marks a real leader out is they don't care where they get the expertise from. They just want to make the thing work. And so the interesting thing about Singapore was when he first, you know, they were chucked out of Malaysia, they were trying to build the country. 
He just brought him, he brought some of the old British colonials back. And he didn't care who, who they were. It didn't matter to him. He had no, there was no sort of false pride about accepting. But today, Singapore ex export intellectual mm -hmm. capital. Mm -hmm. So what I'm always saying, obviously we can only work in a country if people want us to. But, you know, I sometimes give my own example. I mean, I made reforms in the UK healthcare system. You know, brought in, actually, dare I say, with one or two Americans to help <laughs> with that process. Um, it's, you know, yeah, you get a little bit of pushback, but the leaders who are good know that the only thing that matters is delivery. So you said you're in six countries, maybe going on seven. Uh, how do you think about the country choice? How do you, how do you decide uh, where to go? Well, it's a mix. They've, they've got to want us in the sense we've got to want them. Yes. So we've got to work with leaders who are not corrupt, frankly. Uh, we've got to work with leaders who have a clear vision and work with people who want our help. Um, but, you know, it's, it's amazing to see how very quickly you can, you know, as I think I was saying to you earlier, that when we did an analysis for one president of how they used their time, we found that less than 5% of their time was, was on their priorities. <laughs> right? So you had these priorities, but actually they weren't spending any time on it. I, I, one great advice, piece of advice that was given to me by um, a former president of yours, President Clinton, actually, was, was this. This is, I went to see him in, in 1996 in the, in the White House when I was leader of the opposition. And, you know, we had a good meeting and everything. And as I was leading, leaving, he said to me, I want to talk to you about something really important. And I thought, you know, I was quite taken with this. I thought I was going to get some extraordinary piece of geopolitical insight that was about to be, you know, because he'd been president then for kind of like six years in his second term. I thought he's going to tell me there's a secret code. That, you know, <laughs> when, you know so, and he, I said, so I was very excited by it. So I said, uh, what is it? And he said, I'm going to talk to you about scheduling. <laughs> and I said, oh, scheduling. <laughs> and and he, he explained to me, which is, absolutely right, not that he always does it or I always do it in the way we think it should be done, by the way, but he said to me, you will find that one of the hardest things when you get into government is finding the time to think strategically, is being able to create the space so that you are focused on what you really know counts. Because mm. otherwise, he said, the system will take you over and you'll be in meetings from 8 in the morning till... 10 at night and, you know, you'll think you're immensely busy, but actually the tactics and the strategy have all got mixed together. It was great advice, which I actually took and I found it invaluable. And one of the first things I say to any president is, where's your thinking time? Where, where, where's your consideration of where am I going? What am I trying to do? Have I got this thing really, you because know, what happens in politics as well is that things come at you the whole time. So. You know, there was a British Prime Minister who was once asked, and he said, he was asked, what's the most difficult thing about government? And he said, events, dear boy, events. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what's most, so things happen, right? And if you're not careful, something happens, there's a, some crisis, and you spend your time dealing with it, you lose your strategic grip on, on what's going to determine whether you're a successful government or not. Now, these crises are real, you've got to deal with them. But actually, when you then judge a government in history, you know, when I think of the things that I lost sleep on, some of the, you know, crises that suddenly came, like sort of foot and mouth disease, or we had a fuel strike, or a, so, <clears throat> nowadays no one even remembers any of those things. Mm. But you've got to create the space to be thinking strategically all the time. Yeah. And, and when you think about the scope of the assignment when, when you go in, into one of these, uh, how do you think about the, the bounds and the limits on, on what, is it time bound, is it is scope bound, or does it, does it evolve? It, it depends. I mean, you know, fortunately there's no place yet we've been in that we've been chucked out of, so we're <laughs> still there in, in the mall. I, I think it's, you know, it really depends on the country. Um, but we work out priorities with the, the president, and, and it's only when, when, it, when it's helpful, you know, when, when they find it helpful. Um, but I, I think, for most of these countries, they're engaged in a sort of 10-year program of change. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the reality. Yeah. I, I thought maybe we'd switch gears a little bit and broaden the discussion from AGI to uh, aid and, and, and debt more, more generally. 
you've been a tremendous champion of, of both foreign assistance and, and debt relief as key contributors to, uh, to growth and development. What, what do you see as the, the prospects for uh, continued involvement with uh, the austerity that, uh, that seems to be shaping the agenda in, in Europe yeah. and, and other places? Well, I, ho I mean, I hope, uh, I was actually having this discussion with Bill Gates when I was, because I was addressing a conference he was at um, earlier today. I think um, it's really important that we don't misunderstand the fact that although I think that aid is not enough, aid has made a difference. If you take your PEPFAR program in the US that, that has continued under this administration, I mean, you're measuring things in hundreds of thousands of lives. You look at what the Gates Foundation, the Clinton Global Initiative and others have done, I mean, you're talking hundreds of mm. thousands of people. Mm. You know, there are something like 200,000 fewer malaria deaths a year now than 10 years ago. I think even five years ago, actually. 200,000, that's 200,000 people. You know, it's a lot, yeah, of it's a lot of people. Now, so aid does matter. The trouble with aid, though, is ultimately, I think it works better for that type of thing. And, you know, when we canceled the debt of many of these countries, a lot of them were able then to fund free primary education for the first time and so on. So all of this was important. But I, I feel myself that as Africa has shifted, it's also time to, to add this new dimension. So I don't add it in place of aid. And I think for our communities, by the way, it is important that our people, because you know, you will face the same pressures as we face in the UK. I mean, David Cameron, the UK Prime Minister, has made a commitment to maintain our position on yeah. aid, and that's tough to do. You know, I mean, it's a big commitment, and uh, I, it's something I applaud, by the way. Um, but it's important that people who are taxpayers in countries going through periods of austerity yeah. also understand this money is, is actually does result in, yeah. in lives saved, and, and, and it's an investment too for our future. In Africa today, if I was to look at the fragilities, they would be around in sub-Saharan Africa. For example, if you look at um, Nigeria, the problems that they've got with terrorism now and so on, and um, the potential for conflict between different faith communities. You know, if you look at North and South Sudan, if we're helping South Sudan as a new country get on its feet, you know, we hope to go work there. That's, that's, a, that's an investment for our future. Uh, and, you know, it's an investment that is worth making. So I think we've got to rehearse and make these arguments again. Otherwise, I think there is a risk that in times of austerity, certainly in Europe, you know, people say, well, why are we paying money to those people over there rather than spending it here? So picking up on, on this point about the UK, I think the, the UK has been unusually successful at, uh, at maintaining public interest in, in the development agenda. And what, what do you think the, the secret is to that? Why, why has that happened more in, in the UK than, than well, in other places? We've got a great campaign going. Um, before the 2005 uh, summit, G8 summit, I mean, I actually made Africa and climate change the two issues of that summit. And, you know, the, I mean, frankly, some of the other leaders were a bit sort of surprised at the time, I think, with, with Africa being there. But we got a great civic society campaign going where, you know, um, the cancel the debt campaign and so on. You had Bono and Bob Geldof and all these people. And then you had uh, the faith communities. It's civic society. And I, people got inspired by it. But you've got to keep it going. And so it became part of our political consensus in, in the UK. And I, I do genuinely believe this. These countries are you know, if a country like Nigeria goes right, it's going to be a great thing for the world. If it goes wrong, it's going to be a problem. So I, I would love to monopolize your time, but I, I do think we, we need to enter the Twitter sphere and see, see wow. what questions and that's what you're are. Doing, and that's sorry. what I'm doing uh, right here. Right. So uh, I am actually really impressed with this, uh, God, I must say. We, yeah. we have a question from uh, Devesh Senapati, who asks, uh, is American-style democracy the right governance model for the new Africa? Um, well, it is a bigger question, but I actually don't believe there is a, an American democracy or an African democracy. I think there's democracy. Um, you know, I think democracy is not just a way of voting, but a way of thinking. And I think it's basically pluralistic and open-minded. 
Um, so I think in the end, yes, it is uh, democracy is the, is the form of government that most people will choose when they get the chance to choose it. I think there is a, a stage of development in certain countries, particularly when they're coming from a post-conflict situation, when, you know, as it, as it were, you're not going to go straight into, uh, um, if you like, uh, full democracy. I think you can see in the Middle East there are issues as countries try and evolve their systems. But in the end, I think the most effective, you know, you've got to trust the people ultimately. <laughs> um, so, but I think for democracy to work, it does need strong institutions of governance and the rule of law. Okay. Uh, we have a, a question from Adam Kay. Adam is keeping a little bit of anonymity. Uh, is, is Adam here? Adam's here. There's, a, there's Adam. Hi. So Adam. A, Adam's question is, uh, corruption often foils state capacity. Yep. How does AGI deal with bureaucracies and leadership that is fundamentally corrupt? Well, we, uh, we quite honestly won't deal in a country where the leadership is corrupt. Um, it is a problem. It's a huge problem and not just in Africa. But I think there are ways of dealing with it. I, I actually have come to this conclusion with corruption that the best way of dealing with it is to introduce systems that are themselves transparent and, and therefore have their own protection against corruption. So there are two ways you deal with corruption. I think this is an interesting argument in India as well, by the way, at the moment. Do you, as it were, appoint, appoint an anti-corruption czar and so on and you know, focus on individuals and so on? Or do you, in fact, create systems, for example, of public procurement, or where there is extractive industries, systems of attracting inward investment. I actually think those give you better protection. So we work on that, and we try to minimize the corruption, particularly in the development of resources. So it, it is a problem. It's an inhibition. And, and look, the problem with corruption is not just that it's wrong. It's that it's also inefficient. <laughs> um, so we try and take discrete areas of government, if you like, and at least make sure, working with the president and their, their team, that that bit is, is, um, you know, is immune from it or protected against it. And then I think it's also very important at certain points that, that government moves against people who are obviously are corrupt and takes action against them. But the best way of dealing with corruption, I think, is systemic. That's, that's my view. Uh, we have a, a question from Shadi uh, Bushra, and, and Shadi asks how you think about prioritizing governance versus accountability uh, for greater democratic freedom. Yeah, this is, this is difficult, and sometimes where we do get criticism is people say, you know, I, I focus sort of so much on the efficacy, and accountability is also important. And, and my attitude to this is, it is, but there's lots of people who are focused on accountability, on transparency, on some of the very important issues to do with human rights and so on. What I actually believe, though, about government in a lot of these countries is that unless they can get the lights on and the roads built and the food distributed and the medicines distributed, then nothing happens. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't exclude those things at all, and, and, and by the way, we raise those issues, but the focus of AGI is efficacy. I mean, my theory of government today is that government really is about efficacy. It's not so much about ideology anymore. Uh, now, that is, is quite disruptive for normal political parties. They love to think about ideology very much, but I actually think today what most people want is to see government getting things done, moving things, and... Um, that's true, by the way, in our countries, never mind African countries, but um, that's what I focus on. Great. So I think uh, it would be remiss to, to let the, the day go by without um, at least commenting on Facebook, uh, given, uh, given what tomorrow holds. Um, and so you spoke a little bit earth. <laughs> right. Look, I know I'm a politician, but I, because I'm out of practice a bit, I try to talk only about subjects I know something about, but. <laughs> Well, so, I know it's not a I'm characteristic not of my profession, but it's a... Uh... <laughs> not, not asking for a, for a forecast on, on, on the IPO uh, opening pop. Good. Um, but the, the question is this, which is you, uh, you mentioned earlier that technology holds a lot of the keys for, uh, for some of these countries. And I'm wondering specifically about uh, the role of social media in 
uh, in both, especially in governance, but, but more generally in, in society. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is, you know, I find this whole part of the world uh, a fascinating sort of intellectual ecosystem. Um, and the social media that you've developed here, I mean, look, I don't understand a lot of it, but I do understand its importance. Uh, it is a revolutionary phenomenon. I mean, we're not talking about the Middle East today, but which is another place I spend a lot of my time in, but it is, it, it's, it's, it generates the most extraordinary waves of feeling and emotion and opinion that it's impossible for governments to control. Um, it does have its problematic aspects, by the way, but it is extraordinarily liberating for people and it's a transformative fact. So I think social media is enormously important. I think politicians don't quite yet know how to, to get inside the ability to communicate through it, um, but it does offer enormous opportunities. And technology, one of the things that I think is so fascinating to me about emerging countries now is I think technology offers them huge opportunities for reform and change of their basic systems and things like education and healthcare, where my constant plea to them you know, sometimes I get a leader who says to me, when are we going to have an education system like yours? And I say to them, don't ask that <laughs> don't question. Ask that. <laughs> because basically we're, we're now looking at our education systems right around the Western world and thinking, how do we change these pretty fundamentally, in fact? So I would say, think about how you would use technology today if you had the power. And that's why I say electricity and right. power are so important in these countries. Think how you'd use that today. How would you teach differently? So... How would you use Facebook and, and even Twitter and other forms of social media to, to, to make these changes? So <clears throat> I think this is absolutely essential. And one of the things that I think would be really interesting for your work here in Stanford, because obviously of your, your connection with the development of social media, is work out how governments might use this. Yeah. How might you change some systems of government to do this? <clears throat> you know, how might you improve, I don't mean improve communication between government and people, but how might you create better systems of delivery in basic services? I think there are fascinating things that could be done here. I mean, I, I always say to people, you know, if, if we were looking at creating healthcare systems in our countries today, certainly in my country, you know, we would think very fundamentally, the first, the starting point would probably be technology. Right? Now, we don't, Look at it like this, because we get a legacy of how these systems are growing up over time. But this is what I think is, is fascinating and interesting. So I couldn't really give you a, any advice on the IPO. <laughs> um, but uh, <clears throat> but it, is an, it is an advantage for many, many of these economies that they're not burdened, actually, with the legacy systems. They have, they have yeah. greenfield, if you look at uh, leapfrogging via mobile phone and, and, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And look at, I mean, my wife actually has got a great set of projects on women's empowerment using mobile telephones for women starting their own businesses. It's a fantastic program. But I mean, the possibilities are they're huge. Yeah. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, I think, again, one of the things that we can do, is this is why I would like to see our countries moving to that more kind of dynamic engagement. That's why I call it kind of muscular soft power diplomacy, yeah. by which I mean it's not just kind of nice projects that make good pictures, but it's actually things that where we use something we have that maybe other development partners don't have and try and use that and constructively make, to change the country. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, going, going back to, to Twitter, we have a, a question from uh, Clara Crean who asks, what are the education challenges in Africa and how does AGI approach that? Um, well, the education challenges are enormous. I mean, there are still large numbers of kids that don't go to school or the schooling is, is of very poor quality. And I don't want to repeat what I've just said about technology. Um, but in the end, what will matter enormously to these African countries is to develop proper systems of education. But I think they should develop their own systems in their own way. They should learn lessons from us but not replicate. I think we have time just for one more, and I'll, I'll take it from Twitter. Uh, Hamdan Kabir asks... How do you see the role of Western foreign policy evolving in a post-Arab Spring world of self-reliance versus autocracies? Um, <clears throat> well, I think we've got a big challenge here. Uh, I mean, we're talking about Africa, although some of the same issues are there. 
But I think we've got two big challenges, which is why I understand the desire of, of, of Western governments in a way to disengage at the moment from the world's problems because our internal issues are so great. But I think we've got to stay engaged. And in these developing democracies in Africa and in the Arab world, we've got to understand there's two big challenges. The first is on the economy, because these populations are young and they need jobs and they need proper economic policy. I had a conversation with some young Egyptians <clears throat> a, a, a few weeks back, which was fascinating, but also a little alarming. And they kind of said to me, <clears throat> You know, it's fantastic we got our democracy. And I said to them, so what's your economic policy? And they said to me, well, we got our democracy <laughs> now. And I said, no, I know, but I mean, the democracy is a means of deciding your government. It, it doesn't, what's your tax policy? What's your spending policy? Do you think more industry should be in the private sector or do you think the state should control it? Or I said, well, we got our democracy. So <clears throat> I think we need to engage and, and help these countries. Remember a country like Egypt, in the 1950s at a population of 30 million, today it's 90 million, right? The average age all over the Arab world, which is the population of which is set to double in the next 25 years. So you've got massive issues here we've got to deal with. The second thing is about democracy. <clears throat> I think the most important thing is for us to be able to help educate the world, whether in Africa or elsewhere. You know, because it's taken us centuries. You know, we forget this, it's taken us centuries to develop our democracy. You know, in the UK, it was only in the 1920s we had proper universal suffrage. But democracy is a way of thinking and not just a way of voting, right? So democracy isn't just about the freedom to vote. It's about freedom of expression. It's actually about free markets, free enterprise. It's about, you know, albeit with regulation and state intervention and so on. It's about freedom of religion, very, very important. It's actually pluralistic. Democracy is not about the majority ruling, simply. Right? It's also about the tolerance of minorities. It's about the concept of what I would call open-mindedness. I mean, I think the great political divide in the world today is, I mean, yes, there's a sort of legacy of left and right, which is very important in our systems, in your country and my country. But I think in many ways, this is an essentially 20th century distinction. The big dividing line I see in politics in the world today is between what I would call the open and the closed mind. You know, the open-minded see globalization as an opportunity. They see its challenge as spreading the benefits of globalization. You know, they have an open mind on trade, migration, you know, people of different faith and culture. I believe in the open-minded approach. The closed-minded sees difference as a threat, takes it out on immigrants or people of different faith or people of different culture. This challenge to, to, between the open-minded and the closed-minded, I think, is absolutely the heart of it. So when we're engaging with the Arab Spring or the, the democracies that are developing in the world today, we, sh we should engage and say, look, this is actually what democracy means. And we should be supporting the modernizing, reforming, open-minded yeah. tendencies in all these countries. And we should be helping them take the right economic decisions with the support that we can give in order that they're people of economic opportunity along with political empowerment. So I think that's the big challenge. And I think the you know, great thing about a, 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 a school like Stanford is that you, you know, you're a great repository of the open mind. And we need that. Um, and we need that, that sense mm. of empowerment to be there. And, you know, it's a fascinating thing. I, 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 I grew up in the north of England uh, in a place called County Durham, which most of you won't know about, but it's up, up in the north of England. And I, I remember when I was growing up there, I actually remember the day <clears throat> I was 12 years old, I met my first non-white person, mm. right? Everyone was the same, everyone looked the same, thought the same, was basically the same faith and culture. My, uh, actually, this weekend to be 12-year-old son, my youngest son, um, when he will have his birthday party, he will probably have four different faiths represented around, you know, the, the, the table at the party. Now, I actually like that world. Hmm. I, I think this is a great world. I think, I think that, that one of the saddest things is when, 
you know, differences of culture and race and issues to do with immigration get exploited politically. Um, because, in fact, it's an enormously enriching thing that we get people coming, for example, to London from all over the world today, and people mixing together and living together and working together. I think this is a great new world, okay? But I think we've got to go out there and be prepared to proclaim it and, and, and stand up for it and, you know, be prepared to, 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 to believe in its values and, 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 and help bring them to the parts of the world that don't have it. And I think we should always remember when we're at an institution like this, how incredibly blessed we are, how lucky we are to be in it. You know, how the fact that, that so many people can come from so many different parts of the world and be here and participate in this extraordinary right. development of the open mind, we are lucky. Mm. But there are so many other parts of the world that don't have that benefit. So as we're thinking about how we, the students think about how we succeed in life and get on and do well, I think it's also important that we give a bit of our time and a bit of our mind to how we help those people that don't have those blessings in their life. That's a wonderful note on which to end. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Change lives, change your lives, change, change, change organizations, change organizations, change the world.